Um, hope you can all hear me. So um, the first speaker this morning will be Professor Thomas Hales from the University of Michigan. And the title of his lecture will be uh, Can Piatic Integrals Be Computed? When I was preparing to give the first lecture of my career, I asked uh, my thesis advisor, Bob Langlands, if he had any advice about uh, lectures that I gave. And he said the first thing to do in a lecture is to state your conclusions clearly. I'd like to do that. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about computing a certain family of integrals that arise in the connection of the representation theory of piatic groups. These are the orbital integrals. A number of lectures have talked about the fundamental lemma. Uh, I'm going to be saying something about the fundamental lemma. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll give a statement of the fundamental lemma in a special case, so that those of you who are wondering uh, what the fundamental lemma is all about will see it in the context of odd orthogonal groups. Um, but at the beginning of my lecture, it's, it's going to sound like I'm giving the wrong lecture to the wrong crowd um, because I'm going to talk about some uh, techniques that uh, probably aren't used in this crowd so much, uh, but I promise that uh, once I get into a bit, I'll, I'll veer back uh, to the piatic theory and uh, tie things in there. Uh, the central question of my research uh, for some time now is, you know, how do you use a computer to prove theorems, uh, especially those involving geometry? And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to give this lecture, and it's given me an opportunity to think about this question in the context of the fundamental lemma and uh, piatic orbital integrals. Uh, is there some interesting geometry that comes up in the context of these problems, and can you use a computer to understand these questions better? <coughs> so uh, let me say that uh, the first part of the talk is going to involve three separate threads that I'm going to introduce. Uh, the first is uh, uh, some results of Tarski, a decision proce procedure. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, piatic integration and then finally motives, and then uh, I'm going to take these three th threads and tie them together and show what they have to say about uh, the fundamental lemma and piatic orbital integrals. So uh, if you'll just bear with me for a few minutes, um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Tarski's decision theory. Uh, in 19... 30, he proved that there's a decision procedure for sentences in the elementary theory of real closed fields. And let me say a bit about what that means. Uh, and let me also say, for those of you taking notes, that uh, these transparencies are going to be scanned and available on the web. So uh, whatever you don't get down on paper, you can get later uh, on a printer. Um, so he says precisely what he means by the elementary theory of real closed fields. And what you do is you build a little language with a very limited number of symbols. Uh, you allow 0, 1, plus, multiplication, parentheses, and or not. And you allow uh, uh, some quantifiers, um, universal, existential, you allow a bunch of variables, and then a uh, few things like uh, equality and greater than. And the elementary theory are things that you can squeeze into this tiny little collection of symbols in a syntactically correct way. And uh, 
you should note that it doesn't contain a lot of things that you would like a theory of real fields to contain, like it doesn't, uh, you don't have any quantifiers that range over the integers, for instance, in this little language. Uh, you can only have quantifiers that range over all real numbers. And uh, there's, no, there no, there's no set notation in this little notation, so you can't talk about sets directly. Uh, you can't talk about things like uh, pi or e or the natural log of 2 or uh, trigonometric functions like the cosine or uh, you can't do integration uh, in the ordinary sense. But you can do sort of uh, polynomial type things because you have uh, variables and addition and multiplication. And what Tarski's method does is it's a mechanical procedure it starts with any sentence in this elementary language, just using this very limited collection of symbols. And it's a mechanical procedure for the elimination of quantifiers. So you have these universal and existential quantifiers, and uh, you, you put this into Tarski's procedure, and you pop out uh, something that's equivalent, but not containing the quantifiers. So the easy example is like if you say, have the sentence um, a is not equal to zero and there exists an x that's a root to a quadratic equation, uh, you put it into uh, Tarski's algorithm and out comes an equivalent statement, in this case b squared minus 4ac is greater than or equal to zero, uh, that does no, no longer involves quantifiers. And so in this way you're able to decide all sorts of statements in uh, the theory of real fields because uh, you, you just write it out in terms of quantifiers, you put it into Tarski's uh, algorithm, and you get something that where, where the truth is, is very easy to decide. So there, there's no longer any doubt whether it's uh, true or false. So if A, B, and C are specific integers here, uh, then uh, we, we have a decision procedure in this case. Uh, so this works for any number of variables, any number of quantifiers. Here's a slightly more difficult example. Uh, if we want to find what the conditions are for a quartic to be positive semi-definite, we can write that condition uh, in a quantified form for all x, uh, x to the fourth, plus uh, I've eliminated the cubic term, px squared plus qx plus r is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, you put it into this algorithm and you get an equivalent form that does not contain quantifiers in some sense, then you've, you've solved this elementary problem. So, um, Tarski's original procedure was uh, not very useful from a computational point of view. It was very slow. But in 1975, George C Collins found a, a vastly improved method to do this uh, quantifier elimination. Uh, it, you, uh, people use it now, for instance, in ro robotics, you have two objects and you want to know whether they collide or not, you write it out in terms of quantifiers, you apply this algorithm, and it, you know, tells you yes or no, these uh, objects will or will not collide. Uh, so it, it's still a very slow algorithm, but uh, you can get some useful results out about it, and um, I'm, I'm quite interested in this from the point of view of discrete geometry because there are some very non-trivial problems that you can uh, state in terms of this very simple language. So the idea is that you want to squeeze non-trivial results into a very, very simple language and then you want to prove very general results about anything that can be expressed in these simple terms. So I promised not to make this a lecture about real fields, but Piatic, and this took a turn toward the Piatic in 1969. Well, first with Axe and Koch and Ershov proved uh, quantifier elimination results for uh, Piatic fields. Uh, but what I want to talk about grows out of the work more of Paul Cohen, 1969, Decision Procedure for Real and Piatic Fields. And what he did is he took uh, Tarski's result, and uh, well, he, this paper has both a version for the reals, he reproves Tarski's result, and he also gives a piatic version. Uh, then there have been later results by uh, various people, the Neff, McIntyre, Poss, on quanti quantifier elimination for piatic fields. So let me say a little bit about the piatic case of this. So in the real case, 
uh, we had a language that included equality and the greater than symbol. We don't have the greater than symbol anymore. And the language is going to be a little more complicated because there are three sorts of things now in the piatic case. We have the valued field, uh, and then we have something like a valuation going to the integers or some object like the integers. And then we have something like a residue field. And so this language is going to have to involve these three types of objects, the, the, the valued field, the integers, and the residue field. And so we allow symbols as before, uh, 0, 1, plus, multiplication, parentheses, and or not, quantifiers. But now there are going to be three sorts of quantifiers. There, um, there's going to, there are going to be quantifiers over our piatic field, for instance. There are going to be quantifiers over the residue field, and there are going to be quantifiers over the integers. Now, I'm not going to give all the details of this little language, but you have to be careful once you introduce quantifiers over the integers because uh, of uh, decidability results. So, so you limit the language on the integers to, to, just a, to just to the additive theory. So it was proved back in 1929 by Pressburger that just, if you just take the additive theory of the integers, then you get um, uh, quantifier elimination. So you make these restrictions, uh, and then so you have the equality as before, you have variables, but then you also introduce uh, this function ORD, which uh, is the valuation going from the piatic field over to the integers. And you also introduce uh, the angular component. Now, this, this is very uh, nearly the residue map going from the piatic field to the residue field. Uh, so this you think of as just a formal symbol in the language. And what it does is uh, if you have something that's a unit, it's defined just to be the reduction of that into the residue field. But if it's not a unit, you rescale it by a uniformizer until it's a unit, and then you reduce. And so that's, that's uh, the, the interpretation of this uh, symbol angular component, and, and you define it to be zero at zero. So what I'm going to say today is um, going to be related to piatic integrals, but what we want to do is squeeze some things into this language and see what that says for us. Now, just as the language in the real case is missing a lot of things you'd like to have, uh, the same is true of Poss's language uh, in the piatic case. For instance, one thing that's notably missing is a uniformizer. So uh, we can't, any, anything that involves the uniformizer is, is just gone. We, we, we can't use it. Uh, set notation isn't there. Uh, we can't talk about field extensions directly, except you know through the polynomials and so forth uh, that define them, Galois groups. So a lot of things that we'd like to use in the piatic theory are just just gone. Um, so Poss's result, 1989, is sort of extending the the results of Cohen, uh, expressing it in a somewhat different way, is that the piatic quantifiers can be eliminated from this language. Uh, for the theory of Hanselian fields. And uh, the main, a lot of the main applications of this have been to the theory of piatic integration. Uh, so that is going to then take me to my second thread today. So that was a brief introduction to some decision procedures, and we'll, we'll come back to that later. The, the main thing to remember is uh, this little language here. And... Uh, the fact that you can eliminate the, the piatic quantifiers uh, from this by a procedure given by POS. So I'm going to switch topics now for a moment and talk about piatic integration. I'm going to give uh, what, moving back now to what should be more familiar territory. Uh, F will be a piatic field of characteristic zero. G a reductive group. X a semi-simple element. And <coughs> we'll pick uh, a test function F, and the type of integral that we want to compute is an orbital integral. Uh, this is, so what I do is I take this semi-simple element, I take its stable orbit, meaning uh, if two elements are stably conjugate if they're conjugate 
over the algebraic closure and I pick an invariant measure on that orbit and I, this is the type of integral that I want to compute. Now, this type of integral comes up again and again in the, uh, for instance, in the trace formula, harmonic analysis on reductive groups. And you'd like to be able to say something about uh, these integrals. Uh, the fundamental lemma that I'll be talking about later involves just this type of integral. And uh, the fact that the fundamental lemma has not been proved so far is, is related to the fact that these integrals tend to be so hard to compute. Let me give you an example. Um, Um, so, yeah, suit suitably interpreted, yes. Um, Pass's result deals specifically with the piatic quantifiers. Um, Pressburger's result deals with the integer quantifiers. And then there's another result uh, dealing with what's called Galois stratification that does residue field quantifiers. Uh, So, the question is whether you might be able to prove some identities by computing these integrals. And let me give you an example of just one, of the, one particular family of orbital integrals that I've computed so that you have in your mind the type of answer that you might expect from these calculations. So I'm going to assume here that the res residual characteristic of the geodic field is not 2. I let FQ be the residue field. And I'm going to look at just a very special type of element. And those are going to be semi-simple elements in the Lie algebra SO5 that have the property that if I take any root evaluated on that element and take its absolute value, that that absolute value is independent of the root alpha and always half an integer. Okay, so this is just a very special type of element. Um, I'll explain the significance of this type of element later in the lecture, I hope. But um, I'm just, we'll, we'll see what type of answer we get in this case, just as a suggestion for what we might expect in general. Then I'm going to take uh, its characteristic polynomial. Now, since it's an autoorthogonal group, I get a root uh, zero to this polynomial, and when I write a superscript zero, I mean that I've thrown out that root. And so I can think of the roots of this polynomial uh, without zero as plus or minus t1, plus or minus t2, and I get a reduced characteristic polynomial by, well, I, since these are uh, half an integer, I want to rescale these things, so I'm going to square the roots first, so I get an integer, and then I'm going to rescale by the right power of the uniformizer so that I get a unit, and then reduce that and get a smaller polynomial, which I'll call Rx. And using that polynomial Rx, I define an elliptic curve by uh, y squared equals Rx of lambda squared over the residue field. And so this, this defines some elliptic curve <coughs> EX given by a particular quartic with distinct roots. And in this special case, uh, if I take particular functions F and do the calculation of the stable orbital integral, what you find is that, well, you get some boring factors, A and B, rational functions. But then there's this uh, cardinality of uh, the number of points on this elliptic curve over a finite field. Uh, so if, if you have that example in mind, now, now I can start to say, what does it mean to compute an orbital integral? And the answer I propose is that to compute the integral is to find the A, the B, and the elliptic curve EX. Now, naively, you might, when you set out to calculate orbital integrals, you might pick a particular 
local fields, a, uh, you know, Q3, uh, pick a particular parameter X, and put it on the computer and try to get it to calculate um, how many, you know, what that particular orbital integral will be. But uh, from the point of view of what you want from representation theory, uh, that's no good at all because you're, you're wanting to prove identities that hold for all local fields or almost all, at almost all places of some global situation. And so it's, it's not enough just to pick per particular parameters and pick particular local fields. So to do the computation, what you really want to do is some sort of symbolic computation that gets at the underlying variety, that gets at the underlying rational functions. And that is the sense in which I intend the question that I asked at the beginning of my lecture, can piatic integrals be computed? The question is whether you can find this underlying geometric representation of the piatic integral that allows you to, to understand for all local fields what, what the answer will be. Now, if we look more closely at this particular calculation, we might ask uh, what are sort of the properties of the answer that made this calculation possible. So the first observation is that as we vary this parameter x, this elliptic curve, these elliptic curves don't jump all over the place, but they, they vary within a nice family of elliptic curves as I vary the parameter. Uh, second observation. Now if we try to get a computer to calculate uh, orbital integrals for all local fields, well, there, you know, uh, there are infinitely many local fields, right? So, so there has to be some underlying regularity as we go from lo one local field to another. And less, less things vary in a, in a very nice way as we change the local field, a computer is not going to be able to handle this type of situation. And what we see from this particular example is that as we vary the local field, we in some sense have the same elliptic curve at every, or the same family of elliptic curves at every, um, at every place. And so the conclusion that I draw from this is that these piatic integrals can be computed because these are, in some sense, global objects, and the local field is just picking out the number of points uh, in these different realizations of these global objects. So I can think of this elliptic curve as actually being defined over, uh, you know, Q, and I uh, take uh, two transcendentals, and then I get this family of elliptic curves, and, and uh, I can think of the local calculations as all being uh, just various specializations of this one global family of elliptic curves. Now, what about the identities that uh, come up in the fundamental level? Well, let me give you the first identity, one of the simplest identities that you need. Uh, so this is identity here that I've written is something, a special case of the fundamental lemma. Uh, I take this symplectic Lie algebra and the odd orthogonal algebra. Uh, I can relate an element y with an element x by comparing their characteristic polynomials. Uh, one of the characteristic polynomials has root zero, the other doesn't, so I add it in and then I can match up the characteristic polynomials. I take the stable orbits and I take uh, compatible measures on the two. and uh, well, there's, there's this general matching conjecture that asks, you know, can I always find matching functions f and f prime such that these integrals are the same? And then the, the fundamental lemma in this case is the special case if I just take f to be the characteristic function, say, of uh, some integer lattice on, uh, on both of these, then do you still get matching orbital integrals? And in this case, you... Um, you find that you actually get two different elliptic curves when you do the calculation. And uh, the type of identity that you need uh, comes from the matching of the number of points on these two elliptic curves. And again, you, you see that these identities that you want locally, piatically, come from the fact that your two elliptic curves, viewed as a global object, 
are actually isogenous elliptic curves. And it's, it's that fact in this case that gives rise to the matching identities that you want piatically. And now, this is a simple example, and if you actually do this in the case of uh, this rank two case, if you put in the characteristic function of k, the thing that you want for the fundamental lemma, uh, it, it degenerates, and this, and this b is zero in that case. And so you don't actually, in this special low rank case, you don't actually have to uh, produce this isogeny to prove the fundamental lemma. The fundamental lemma turns out to be easier than that in this case. But as soon as you get to rank three, uh, it doesn't degenerate, and you, and you really do have, have these objects. So. Uh, what this suggests, then, is that, in general, you might hope that there are some global objects attached to these local piatic orbital integrals. And uh, this isogeny suggests that the correct object might be something like a Chow motive, because you want to say that two things are the same if you have some sort of uh, correspondence between them. And so is it just, just I'll, I'll, I'll give some definitions, but um, so for this this idea to work, that the computation is somehow the discovery of this this underlying geometrical object, you you need to believe somehow that lots and lots of piatic integrals are actually geometric in, in origin, rather than just some number that you compute. And, and for this, um, I'm, I'm going to state what I call the deneff loser principle that they articulated in their uh, in Strasbourg Motives Conference uh, last year, that all natural piatic integrals are motivic. And I'll try to uh, say more about what that means. And in fact, my whole lecture can somehow be viewed as an application of what Deneff and Lozer have been doing. So this takes me to third thread. Uh, and that is motives. Uh, so. I want to say a little bit now about motivic integration. It's uh, been around for a while now, so many of you will be familiar with it, but let me just give a quick review. And I'll start out with a ordinary uh, piatic integral here. Uh, so this is just a typical calculation of uh, a piatic integral. I have the absolute value of x to k. I'm integrating over the integers. I break this up as an infinite sum uh, according to the valuation of this element x. And I get an infinite uh, geometric series in q times the, the volume of the units. And that's OK. So I just an easy piatic integral for us. Uh, and what Kansevich does in uh, the theory of motivic integration, and, and later developed by Deneff and Lozer in a series of beautiful papers, is they generalize this type of calculation to situations where FQ is no longer a finite field. So looking at this example, uh, we see that we get the same answer no matter what we put in for FQ. So we might suspect that the answer uh, in the case of, say, k, a field of characteristic 0, should be the same formula. After all, well, you know, we do all, all finite fields and we get the same answer. Why not guess that the same answer is appropriate uh, for a field of characteristic 0? Uh, the only problem is with the interpretation of the uh, letter q now. Uh, q, uh, we no longer have a prime power uh, for it to be. Uh, so the question is, what is Q? Well, it, Q is the 17th letter of the alphabet. It's, it's, it's a symbol. And, and what kind of symbol is it? Well, in the case of finite fields, it's the symbol associated with uh, the affine line. So we count the number of points on one-dimensional affine line over FQ. And so 
in general, we should just let it be a symbol associated with this particular variety. So this is a very simple example of motivic integration. Every time, you, you just do integration the way you always have piatically, uh, but whenever you come to some variety where you need to count the point, you just introduce a symbol and move on, and uh, then other than that, you do everything the same way as you've done piatically. So, I mean, it was really the, the genius of Konsevich to, to do publicly what we've all been doing in private, in the sense that <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we've, we've, all been, we've all been doing symbolic integration piatically because, I mean, you know, who after all, you, you know, checks whether, you know, 1024 is a power of 2 to do a piatic integral. We, we use Q as a, as a symbol. And, and so in that sense, there's, there's no reason why we have to restrict ourselves to finite fields. And so that's, that's what motivic integration is. And what you need is a symbol for every variety, and so, or every isomorphism class of variety, and you want this integration to be linear, and so you force relations on this, these symbols to make it linear, and you say you want the product of volumes to be volumes of products and so forth, so, so you force uh, these symbols to be multiplicative, and what you get is a Grotendieck ring of algebraic varieties over K, um, from this simple example here, uh, you see that we're going to have to invert Q, and so now I'm going to call Q L for Lefschetz, and we're going to need to invert that symbol to do even very simple integrals, so let's uh, just firmly invert that L in this ring, and the other thing that we see that we're going to need to do is take some sort of completion because, uh, after all, we have an infinite series here in, in Q, and so uh, what we do is we take this thing, we invert L, and then we complete it, and that becomes the target ring for our symbolic uh, integration, and now we can do integration quite generally um, in other situations. So, just... Um, this, so this, this is the ring, the target ring for our, our integration. And uh, what, what we do is we take, so the category of Chow motive, so I'm taking rational equivalents here, and I think of these as triples, uh, S, P, and N, where, uh, so these, this is going, S is going to be something over K, P is going to be a correspondence, with coefficients in Q bar, and N is going to be an integer, and uh, so I won't give the details of this category, but there's uh, a category of such objects. Uh, this category, we can take the Grotendieck group of this category, that's what I mean by taking this K0. Uh, then I, uh, uh, this, uh, by some results of Gilles Soule, there, there's, there's a map of this, this, uh, uh, this ring up here into this ring up here, and I, I put a little check to denote the image, and then I need to, to, take, to do integration, I need to be able to take limits, and so I take a completion uh, just to make, I mean, it's really just modeled on this. I mean, we need this type of thing to converge. So if we have big powers of Q in the denominator, uh, we want to say those things are going to zero. And so if we just look at the dimension of the uh, thing in the numerator over the thing in the denominator, and that, if that's going to negative, we define a filtration such that these things all converge. And so by motive, I mean just uh, an object inside this particular ring. So, let me say a few words about, so there's a preprint by Denaf and Lozer called the definable sets, motives, and piatic integrals. And I said at the beginning of my lecture that there are going to be three threads that I'm going to tie together. Uh, the first having to do with these uh, decision procedures, second was piatic integration, and the third thread was motives. And it's this paper of Deneff and Lozer that ties those three threads together, 
roughly what they do is they show that motives can be attached to formulas written in this very special language attached to piatic fields. So if, if you can put something, uh, I mean, if, if something is special enough that you, you can fit it into that, squeeze it into that little language, then you can attach a motive to it. And roughly speaking, uh, what you do is you take this formula and uh, you look at the, the set of, you know, x that satisfy this formula, and you take the motivic volume of that, of that set, and that, and that is your motive. And they also have a comparison theorem in their paper that relates the trace of Frobenius on that motive back to piatic integration over this set defined by the formula. So, this, so they, they define motives, and they show that these motives are related to uh, piatic integrals. So let me just give a little diagram showing. So you have a formula, and by formula I mean one of these formulas in this little language, and you can pick local models where you get uh, sets of piatic points which satisfy the formula, and then you can take an ordinary volume, a piatic volume of those things, and get a number. Or you can go in the other direction and take a formula and take some sort of global model for that formula and, and get a thing in an arc space which has a motivic volume. And uh, if you take the appropriate trace of Frobenius on those things, then you get the same number by their comparison theorem. So that was a long introduction, but uh, I felt that it was uh, perhaps uh, needed to explain what it is that I've uh, been doing recently, and that is that um, we want to now express orbital integrals in this framework uh, established by Deneff and Lozer. So we're going to take a, a piatic field of characteristic zero. So now, now I'm going to start to describe my results. and. This is all modeled on that particular case of an elliptic curve that I showed earlier in the lecture. And what I want to do is now generalize that to a more general uh, setting and, and get uh, geometrical objects attached to orbital integrals. So I'll start with parameters uh, n, k, and r. r will be a rational number, uh, n and k will be positive integers. Uh, the group, the, the Lie algebra that I want to look at is the odd orthogonal group, and the Lie algebra um, that is related to it by the theory of endoscopy is a product of odd orthogonal group, uh, odd orthogonal algebras whose ranks add up to n. And this parameter I'm going to use. Uh, to define a set similar to the set that I used for the elliptic curve. So these are elements of equal valuation. So I take all roots, look at the absolute value, and that should be independent of the element alpha. I get a characteristic polynomial as before, and I can get a reduced uh, characteristic polynomial as before by taking the roots of the equation, rescaling, the, uh, taking a power so that it's an integer power, and then rescaling so it's a, a unit, and then reducing. And that, uh, that gives me a new polynomial. Now, I, I promise to say a, a word about why I'm restricting myself to these uh, special elements of equal valuation. Uh, I really expect the orbital integrals to degenerate outside these strips. Now, that, I, I was originally planning to give my whole lecture about this one point, and it, it's quite involved. But as I see it, what happens is the theory sort of breaks into two pieces. There, there's this equal valuation case where all the roots have equal valuation, and, and there's one set of techniques that will be relevant there, and then there's the non-equal valuation where it's an entirely different set of techniques. The, the two groups can be working on the fundamental lemma completely independently without collaboration. That, you know, here, here you have, 
here are the issues or things such as, you know, uh, generalized homogeneity laws in the sense of Valsberger, uh, descent arguments, and, and so forth. And, and here, in the equal valuation case, you really have the, the geometry. And, and it's just this one part that I'm talking about today. This other part is going to be very important to the theory, and it's going to be very difficult to, to establish what you need. But I'm, I'm just, I, I just can't talk about both today. So. So let me, based on our example with elliptic curves, um, if two of these, so we saw in the case of elliptic curves that if these two reduced, polynomial, reduced characteristic polynomials were the same, then they had the same orbital integrals. And the natural guess to make in general is that the same thing is true. If their reduced characteristic polynomials are equal, then their orbital integrals are equal. And what this does is it divides so I, I have this, uh, this strip of things where everything have equal valuation R. And then if I partition that uh, according to the reduced characteristic polynomial, I get a collection of tubes around uh, uh, for each orbit. I, I get a tube of things with the same reduced characteristic polynomial. And we hope that uh, these integrals are going to be the same on each tube. So I promised that sometime in my lecture I would at least state a version of the fundamental lemma. Uh, in the case of the odd orthogonal group, it looks something like this. And I, I've just written it out for a given strip. So there's a, a power of Q that comes in. And there's a sine function which takes values. It's either 0, 1, or minus 1. Uh, this is. Uh, so often, well, the way Langlands and Shellstadt write things out, they combine the power of Q and the sine, and that's generally called the langlands shellstadt transfer factor. The power of Q, so for classical groups, uh, it's just a power of Q uh, depending on the elements times of this sine 0, 1, or minus 1. And uh, you take a sum over all elements x whose, uh, so I fix elements y and z. And for all y and z, I take, uh, I should have the stable orbit here on this uh, product of smaller orthogonal group. And I just take the characteristic function of the integer points. And on the other side, I match up the characteristic polynomials. And I sum over all the orbits in that stable orbit and then there, and attach this sign. And the conjecture is that these two things are the same. So <coughs> first result, well, to state is the following proposition, at least in uh, sufficiently large residual characteristic, this sine function that's uh, used in the definition of the langlands shellstadt transfer factor is given by a formula in the language of rings. So uh, what this means <laughs> um, is, well, for one thing, it, it's, it's, I was quite surprised. I sort of expected it to be expressed in this language of pos with you know, the valuation and, and angular component and so forth. But you don't even need that to express this transfer factor. It, it's really a very, very simple uh, formula when you write it out in terms of quantifiers. And um, <coughs> Well, the starting point for this, uh, is, so this is, this is really a simple corollary of the formula that Vols Berger gives for the transfer factor in the case of odd uh, orthogonal uh, Lie algebras in his uh, book that uh, appeared earlier this year. You take, he, he took the Langland Shellstadt transfer factor, simplified it a great deal for classical Lie algebras, and wrote it out explicitly in his book. And if you just stare at that formula in his book, you see that, I mean, it's, it's a very, very simple thing. Uh, now, a special case of this is if you look at the formula for, you know, where the sign is uh, 1 or minus 1, well, that's just given by the matching of uh, characteristic polynomials. And you see this is just a nice uh, constructible set. And so it's, it's somehow generalizing this, this fact that you get a, a, a nice, Really nice set. So the picture looks something like this. 
uh, the, so as you vary the local field, there's sort of a, one formula that works at every single local field in, in this very simple language. And if you pick out all the plus one sets, for instance, as you vary things, there's actually a, a global motive that shows how, how those things uh, relate to each other as you, you vary from one local field to the other. And that's all just given by, I mean, there's this general setup by Deneff and Loser that once you have a formula for something, you can attach motives to things. And so there's a plus one motive, uh, which is actually a global object. And there's a minus one motive, a, a global object. And Langland Shellstat factor is, in s some sense, that, that global thing that is patching them all together. So, so now you can't say the same thing about the individual orbits uh, because the individual orbits are going to have piatic uh, characteristic functions with piatic coefficients, and those piatic coefficients, you don't even have a uniformizer in your language. So you can't express the coefficients of that characteristic polynomial in any simple way. But that, that's the whole point of introducing these tubes. These tubes are okay. So if things are, if these integrals are really constant on each of these tubes, then you can attach, you have this reduced characteristic polynomial, you can attach sort of a, you can think of that as a, a specialization of, of some polynomial with, uh, I take the ring of integers in some number field, and uh, the parameters x now are going to be, uh, I introduce parameters uh, which can be thought of as parameters inside uh, conjugacy classes of some smaller Lie algebra, and what you find is that then the, these tubes can be expressed in this uh, very simple language as well. And what that means is that you can attach global objects to these tubes. You can attach global objects to the transfer factor. And so then the using, so that then it's an immediate consequence that you have these motives, these, these objects in this ring that I defined earlier, uh, one corresponding to the plus one part of the Langland shell set sign, and another attached to the minus part of the Langland shell set sign. So if I take that conjecture of the fundamental lemma that I put down earlier, and I just replace Q by L here, um, and, and then there'll be a similar thing for this endoscopic algebra, you, you get an identity of, a uh, conjectural identity of Chow motives that is somehow governing the fundamental lemma, this local piatic thing, at almost all places. So this, this somehow is sort of the, the geometrical content, at least on one of these strips, of what the, the fundamental lemma is, is asserting. And if you use the comparison theorem of Deneff and Loser, it relates the trace of Frobenius on these things back to the ordinary piatic orbital integrals. And so you can uh, relate this back uh, to the classical piatic fundamental lemma. So, so what you get uh, out of this Deneff and Loser theory is the existence of these uh, motives. Um, <coughs> now, I, I state this as a re remark rather than a theorem that uh, the fundamental lemma follows from uh, this, this other conjecture just because uh, the, the way their comparison theorem works, you, you need to uh, you, you need to invert some elements. So you, you might not get quite the full fundamental lemma the way it's currently stated, but it, I, I think with a little bit of work you, you can actually get a statement of the sort that uh, the motivic fundamental lemma implies the, the classical one. Uh, one, of the, one of the most surprising things about this form, calculation for me was that this somehow means that there are two local global pathways that come up in this local harmonic analysis because, see, Classically, I mean, the piatic orbital integrals, after all, 
come up from the theory of the trace formula and, and something that's already global in nature. And, but, but you can't just use that local global connection to understand these p-adic orbital integrals because if you, I mean if you take a global element x in your Lie algebra, almost everywhere that's going to be unramified. And, and that's going to give a very un interesting orbital integral. What, what this construction that uh, Deneff and Lozer here does is it patches together uh, orbital integrals from data that is, for instance, everywhere locally ramified with the same type of ramification, and it patches those ramified objects together into a new global object that, that really seems to be quite different from the thing that you started with when you started out with this trace formula. So at the end, let me just give a few problems. So I start out with the question um, of computing orbital integrals. And so, and, and I said that, you know, computing orbital integrals should be somehow finding these, these geometrical representations of the object. And so the, the problem that I stated, began the lecture with should somehow be finding effective algorithms for computing these uh, virtual motives that are attached to the fundamental lemma. Uh, second problem, now this, this I think shouldn't be too hard. I think it's just a matter of uh, patching together results in the literature and making sure there are no gaps and maybe rewriting a few uh, uh, rewriting a few lemmas to be algorithmic, but it, I, it should be pretty much follow from what's in the literature already. Uh, problem two, uh, there's this hope of, you know, we want the orbital integrals to be constant on these tubes, and, and so that needs to be proved. And that, that's what makes it so that these uh, orbital integrals fall into very nice uh, families of, of objects. And there's, uh, so Clifton Cunningham has some results along these lines, if, if not saying exactly this, something approximately this. And so, you know, there's, there's hope that out of his research that uh, problem two should be solved. Uh, then there's this problem that I, I've just talked about, the equal valuation case. I mentioned that um, the non-equal valuation case is going to be a very difficult problem. Uh, there are the de degeneracies and homogeneity laws and, and descent arguments and things that need to be dealt with here. This, I think, is a very big project to show that there are finally many motives that govern the fundamental lemma for all say regular semi-simple elements rather than just uh, these equal valuation elements. Uh, this, this I would compare to, you know, one of the, you know, large uh, projects of Vols Berger on orbital integrals or something. I mean, th this I think it will be a very big project, but it, it's something that's quite, quite doable. And then, of course, the last problem with the star is uh, prove the fundamental lemma. Uh, so, I don't know, I, I'm, you know, I, some days I think this is going to be really hard, and some days I think it's going to be not so bad. I mean, in the cases that have been done, the worst things that come up are hyperelliptic curves, and they're rather nice families of hyperelliptic curves. Uh, the question is, do you, are these examples nice because the theory is nice? Are these nice because uh, we're only capable of computing the nice examples? And I really don't know the answer to that question. Uh, I sort of hope that, uh, you know, we could uh, write a computer program, churn out a bunch of examples, see what the pattern is as we go up in rank, and find that it's very, some very nice family of objects governing the uh, p-adic orbital integrals, but there's no guarantee that things will be simple. I'd, I'd like to think that the answer will be simple and that, you know, the, these motives that come up in p-adic, with p-adic integrals, of course, will be uh, closely related to the ones that come up as the, the characters of, uh, say, admissible representations, for in instance, say, on elliptic elements. And so it, it would be very desirable to understand what these, these global objects are that govern the local theory. So let me just uh, conclude. 
um, with uh, the observation that this uh, apparatus of uh, Deneff and Loser seems to me mesh very nicely with uh, the types of integrals that people want to, to evaluate in the context of representation theory. And uh, the calculations that I actually did were, were very simple. They were just uh, applications of, uh, you know, this, this theory that's out there, and that gives real hope that uh, there may be uh, use for these ideas with other classes of integrals that come up in representation theory as well. So, thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, the yes, so the question is, is there a reason I did not consider the equal characteristic case? Uh, Deneff and Loser do the equal characteristic case in their paper, and in fact, the statements that they get are actually stronger in that case than uh, the unequal characteristic case. So, uh, so the, the, every, everything applies to that case as well. What's that? No, I know, but they, they don't use it directly in the, in the finite characteristic case. They use, um, yeah, I mean, they, they bring everything back to characteristic zero in their paper. Yes? Yes? So, um, Pressburger is doubly exponential. The, the, the vastly improved Collins method in the real theory is doubly exponential. Um, there have been no estimates in the Piatic case that I'm aware of, at least as of a few years ago. There are no estimates. Uh, Cohen's method is definitely extremely slow. Uh, so, you don't I mean, like I say, th this gives the existence statements, but, but a lot of work would have to be done to... to no, that's, that still depends. So, if, if, you, if you could prove one, two, and three, uh, then, but, but still there's, there's the extra step beyond one, two, and three of deciding when two of these two virtual motives are equal, which is not, <laughs> well, you all know <laughs> more about this question than I do, but that, that's not an easy question. Uh, it's a uniform statement that doesn't refer to the nature of a given torus. Uh, well, I mean, this, this elliptic curve first came up, you know, in this paper, fixed points on affine, uh, affine manifolds um, by, uh, what was it, Kajdan, Lustig, Bernstein. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, the, the, the same examples come up again and again in different contexts, and I don't know if anybody has a real unifying view of, of these things, but.
same thing. Uh, well, I, I mean, there's a separate question of whether uh, characters are motivic in the same way. I don't know if that's your question, but, uh, you know, presumably they are. Um, I, I don't know. Well, if there are no other questions, let's thank the speaker for the